Welcome and thank you very much for joining us at our second Resilient Futures Community of Practice workshop. My name is Jennifer Broadhurst and I will be hosting you today at this workshop on behalf of our uh, project leadership team. For those of you who are not familiar with the Community of Practice Initiative, which is funded by the DST and the NRF, this has been set up specifically to establish collaboration amongst research chairs with a view to forming strategic partnerships within the research community, uh, conducting evidence-based research solutions specifically to societal challenges, and translating research findings into actionable policy. So this could be then considered as a brief COP project, so it's funded by the government and our final outputs will be uh, to a couple, at least one policy, integrated policy brief. So for this project, um, there are four South African research chairs involved, all of them um, at the University of Cape Town. So Harun Borat, he holds the Saatchi in uh, Developmental Economics. He's the PI for the project, Oops, sorry. And he um, leads the development Policy Research Unit Team. Henry Mostert holds Asachi in Mineral Law in Africa and she heads the Mineral Law in Africa team. Uh, Sue Harrison holds Asachi in Bioprocess Engineering and she leads the Centre for Bioprocess Engineering Research Team, also known as CEBA, as well as the Future Water Team, for which she is Director. And then the fourth founding member uh, was Dee. Bradshaw, who unfortunately passed away last year. She held the Saatchi Chair in Minerals Beneficiation, and I have subsequently stepped into Dee's place in this project, and I'm heading the Minerals to Metals team. So the case study for this particular COP is focused on driving post-mining industrial development through fibrous multi-product value chains. And just to give this project a little bit of, of context, there are approximately 6,000 abandoned mines in South Africa at the moment. And I think we, we all know, are very much aware that there are more closures uh, expected in the near future, particularly in the gold sector. Um, and, and these mines all too often leave behind uh, um, significant environmental and socio-economic burdens. So we're talking about polluted and degraded lands and also economic vacuums, particularly in cases where the mine has been the predominant and sometimes even the only generator of economic activity in a region. But it's also been increasingly accepted, and you see this amongst mining companies a lot these days, that post-mining land use for agricultural purposes offers the, the potential to both restore degraded land and stimulate economic uh, growth beyond the life of mine. And fiber producing plants are of particular interest due to their potential to create uh, multi-product value chains and simultaneously absorb metals from soils. So this sort of provides the motivation for the CRP project, the uh, overarching objective of which is to explore whether fiber-rich plants such as bamboo and bass fibers in particular can be used to remediate degraded land in a way that is economically feasible, leads to enhanced economic complexity, promotes the establishment of a fiber micro-industry, creates higher value bank products, and provides employment opportunities on a regional basis. And our approach here is we, we, we approach the three leads this whole problem or, or, or objective from four different perspectives. So the environmental perspective is investigating uh, the environmental factors that influence the ability of rapidly growing fiber-rich plants to remediate damaged and polluted lands. The engineering perspective is exploring the processing alternatives for um, the downstream recovery of multi-value products and the implications or consequences of these different alternatives. The economics perspective is looking at how economic complexity can be built um, on the basis of an understanding of local socioeconomic linkages. And the legal perspective 
is investigating the regularity barriers and how these can possibly be addressed using sort of the carrot and stick approach. So if you're interested, there's more uh, information can be found about this project on our website. So we've got a, a dedicated website there, www.resilientfutures.uct.ac.za. Um, for this particular workshop, we are going to be focusing on the environmental and engineering perspectives. So we held a, a sort of, uh, introductory workshop about a year ago that provided an overview of the project. We're going to have another two workshops coming up in the next couple of months. And these will probably be in Cape Town and will focus on the economic and legal perspectives. But this, for this one, you've all got detailed agendas, I think, in front of you, but just to run through some of the key items. So this morning, we'll have two sessions. The first session will focus on mine rehabilitation and crop cultivation and the second one on the processing of crops to products. In each of these sessions, we will have three presentations, followed by a question and answer session. And the presentations will uh, consist of one presentation by the, uh, to provide feedback by the project team, and then two presentations by external experts that have been invited to come and speak. Uh, after lunch, we will be running a round table discussion session and this will be followed by a guest lecture by Redford Mulbauer from Anglo Coal, and she'll be talking about the very exciting Green Engine initiative, which is looking at life beyond coal. And then we'll wrap up at 4 o'clock with closing remarks. So quite a, a busy day. So I think without further ado, I'd like us to get going with the first session on mine rehabilitation and crop cultivation. And Shilpa and Shifuke Mabasa will be presenting uh, feedback from the CEBA project team. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Shifu Gawawasa. I'm from uh, the, CEBA tree, uh, the CEBA team. So uh, me and my team are looking at the, to answer the question uh, whether FEPA, which part can serve the general role of uh, remediation of mine degraded land and simultaneously uh, produce FEPA to fuel the multi product value chain. So uh, these are my team members, uh, uh, led uh, by Professor Suhelsen, who is unfortunately not here today. So just to add to the background uh, of the study, which Jimmy has already touched on, we are in a state of crisis uh, in South Africa, because as things stand, unemployment rate is increasing, and then uh, currently it's over 25%. And then uh, since uh, the late 1980s, we've uh, had about 300,000 uh, job losses from the mining sector. And then uh, as of 2016, we have had uh, uh, 5,900 abandoned mines in South Africa. So these mines, they have been abandoned, they have not been rehabilitated. And then it doesn't seem as if there's a plan from the government or from uh, other stakeholders to rehabilitate the, the mines. So what's happening is that uh, contamination continu is continuously seeping through the environment and uh, which leads to loss of biodiversity. So uh, what we're trying to do based on this background, we're trying to create a, a new economy um, based on mine re uh, rehabilitation. Uh, and then uh, we're looking to rehabilitate uh, the mines using uh, phytoremediation and we're also looking at to use the metals because uh, as, as contamination spreads through the environment, uh, trace metals as well also spread through the environment. So we're looking to remediate the land and then uh, have a beneficial use of the metals and generate a new economic output using our selected uh, fibrous plants. So uh, just a quick overview of uh, phytoremediation. Uh, we've come up with factory limitation because uh, it is it's one of the easiest techniques to use. Uh, it's more sustainable compared to your traditional uh, remediation techniques and uh, it's more or less self-funding. So there are four main processes of uh, phyto remediation, which we have uh, phyto degradation, phyto stabilization, phyto volatilization, and uh, phyto extraction. So the plants which we have chosen, uh, they're going to be using the process of uh, phyto extraction, which is essentially when we, when we plant them, they're going to release uh, chemicals which will make the metals in the soil more bioavailable and uptake them into different parts. 
Also, looking at the fibrous economy, which uh, we are looking to develop, from the fibrous plant, uh, we can get the fiber, which we can then uh, categorize into long fiber and short fiber. And then, just from those long and short fibers, these are the potential products which we can get. So we can get uh, ropes, biocomposite, fabrics, and more products. And uh, for from other parts of the plants, which is not the fiber, from seeds, leaves, and roots, we can also get NAG, pharmaceuticals, oils, and uh, biochar. So we've also looked at literature uh, to try to find out where can we, before we select the plants, what areas in South Africa can we try to uh, uh, put this plan into practice. So we've come up with four sites. Uh, one is in Pumalanga, one in Carlton uh, uh, another one Amanda Belt, and another one in Rustenburg. So we've specifically chosen these sites because uh, they are mine degraded sites and then they are surrounded by areas which are densely populated by human beings and then uh, there's, uh, there's pollution because most of them are gold, uh, gold mines so there's uh, problems of basic mine drainage and uh, they are arable compared to other areas in terms of pH and climatic conditions. So we've also tried to categorize the characteristics of these sites. So cultural bill uh, it's a gold mine, so we find uh, gold and associated metals. And then Wheat Bank is a coal mine, Emalathene, we find coal and associated metals, and the Rustin Bank and Amanda Bank are platinum mines. So we find platinum and platinum group metals. So we've also tried to look at the salt texture because it's uh, very important because these plants which we are using are very selective. So and then uh, we find uh, that those salt types, and then also look at the pH. So the pH in this, all these areas, they, they range from slightly acidic to slightly basic. Uh, some of them are neutral in other areas. And then we'll also look at the rainfall because we do need water if we want to, to grow crops in an area, which is uh, unfortunately low in all areas. And then we'll also try to look at the temperature range in the areas. So it goes from cold to warm climate. So we've also checked now uh, what fibrous plants are currently grown in South Africa or have been grown in South Africa before. And then we've classified this according to the fiber type. So we have our best fiber, leaf, seed, fruit, root, and grass. And uh, under grass, we have uh, the most uh, famous one, the bamboo plant. And then we have uh, bus fibers, which are your hemp, also famous, and kenev. So we have also went further to try to classify this fibrous plant according to their characteristics, cultivation requirements. So for bamboo, we've chosen the bamboo uh, balakoa because uh, compared to other bamboo species, uh, it's the most least invasive uh, bamboo. And then uh, we've checked the soil type, and then we've checked uh, preferred rainfall, which is our water requirement. And then we've also checked the temperatures, pH tolerance, and the weather it grows uh, more than once a year, or if this only grows once a year. So of course, uh, one thing to notice is that uh, most of these plants, they have a higher requirement of rainfall compared to the areas which we had, which means that if we were to grow any of these plants, we need extra water from the mines. And then also, uh, we must check uh, the temperature as well. Uh, most of them prefer warm climates, which we do have uh, in those areas. But then uh, most of them are going to suffer if you do grow them during uh, the cold season. Um, and then from here, I'll uh, leave it to my colleague, Shipla, to come and continue. Thank you. So, um, as Shipla was mentioning, is we actually has this long list of fibers, of fibrous plants. And we actually realized that in most of our example sites, we have a wide range of temperatures ranging from cold to warm. So what we ended up doing is that we narrowed down the list of plants that can actually grow over a wider range of temperature. So we actually discarded the one that uh, need like mostly like humid and tropical regions. So we ended up with like five, five, um, five plants. And uh, one of the disabled features is out of the five selected plants, four of them are actually boss fibers. And we have only one grass type, which is our bamboo. And also, um, bamboo and sisal are perennial plants, while the rest of them are annual. 
One important uh, feature of bamboo though is that it does require a high amount of rainfall. So if we were to actually grow that in one of our example sites, we would actually need a site where there is additional water to supplement the rainfall. And what I also want to draw your attention to is the wide range of products that you can actually get from all of these five plants, ranging from my like products, pulp, chemicals, from the oil seed companies that products. We will talk more about, more about products in the second session of um, this workshop. So our ship we mentioned as well is uh, we're trying to do factor remediation. So what we went on, we tried, we went on and tried to collect data on whether our selected plants can actually um, accumulate those metals. And um, this was actually a very tedious process because the information was very hard to get because it is not reported in a standard way. It is either reported in either metal uptake, absorption, or concentration. And also, um, it's only, the information is only available for a limited amount of metals. But what we can safely say is that all of the five plants can actually bioaccumulate the metals. But also, what I want to talk about now is like, there are actually specific plants who do phytoremediation, and those are called hyperaccumulators, and they actually do the job very well, and they can accumulate up to 1% of their whole uh, biomass. So now we're talking about fibrous plants, and uh, the question remains is whether our fibrous plant can actually accumulate as much metal as those designated hyperaccumulators. So uh, this brings us to our sorry, next slide. This is actually a table showing some of the most common hyperaccumulators grown in SA. And as you can see, they do accumulate a wider range of metal compared to the fibrous plant, and they also accumulate more, um, more metals. In this slide, we have only shown the amount of metals in the leaves because this is the region where they do actually accumulate most, but they, do, they also accumulate in the roots and shoots. And also, if you look at the rainfall data, the pH and the temperature, you can actually, um, you can say that they can actually grow in most of our example sites. So, what we do propose is that the combined use of hyperaccumulators and fibrous plant will offer you more possibilities of a longer term. Because fibrous plant, when they are grown on heavily contaminated soils, they have been shown to have a reduction in their growth, their performance and yield. Therefore, more fibers will get compromised. Whereas if you use the hyperaccumulated plants first, you can do the mediation quicker and then you can take out more stuff from your heavy metals first. And then your fibrous plant can then grow on your um, less contaminated soil. And this will also offer you more flexibility to choosing your products. Because uh, some of the fibrous plants, they do accumulate the metals in some of the harvestable parts of the plants. So it's going to be tricky to get the fibers and the metals as well. Whereas when you have the hyperaccumulators, this plant is specific to get the metal out, and then your fibrous plant will be more specific for the fibers and the other products such as your oil seed. And because of that, also your processing will be easier. And what we went on and do is like we decided to do a scenario analysis on um, a 10 hectare of contaminated land and try to extract the nickel from it using uh, bulky acrylide as our hyperaccumulator and hemp as our fibrous plant. So first off, because we did actually mention there's a difference on the metal uptake between fibrous and hyperaccumulator, what we did is that we tried to compare the amount of nickel that could be removed from using your hyperaccumulator and your hemp. So on, on the right hand side, you can see that um, using those are all literature values, we know how much um, our hyperaccumulator, the dry biomass of a hyperaccumulator for 10 hectares. And also because they can hyperaccumulate up to 1% of their uh, biomass, we can deduce that they're gonna, um, they will be able to extract up to 2,200 kg of nickel. And with the price of nickel being 184, we can actually expect a potential revenue of over 400,000 rand. Whereas if you use your hand to extract your metals, the amount of nickel that they can extract per hectare is significantly lower, and also the higher number here, the 2.03, is actually when you harvest the whole plant. So if you harvest the whole plant of the metals, it will be difficult to get your fibers. And as it is, even the highest number will give you significantly less uh, revenue from nickel. And now we try to investigate the value that we can get using um, the hemp fiber price and the seed price as well. So what we have here is like three, three, 
we have a free production system because you can actually grow hemp for their fibers only, or you can grow them for um, the seed only, or you can have like a dual system where you grow them to harvest both of their fibers and seed. But what you can see here is like if you grow them for their fiber only, your yield will be higher. Whereas when you grow them for seed, the seed yield will be obviously um, higher. But then in the dual system, both of the fiber yield and seed yield will be lower. So we have a scenario analysis where we have like a low productivity, a medium low productivity, a medium high, and a high productivity. So this sort of gives, gives us like a range of fiber and seed yield which, which with, we can work with and then try to calculate the values. But also, since um, if we're going to use hemp, oh, sorry about that. <coughs> if we're going to use um, hemp system only to, to um, accumulate your metal and have your fibers and seed as well, you essentially grow your hemp on contaminated soil, so we can assume that you're going to have a low to medium of productivity. Whereas, if we use like a combination of our hemp per accumulator and hemp, we can assume that your hemp per accumulator will take up most of your heavy metal first, and then uh, obviously your hemp will then grow on less contaminated soil, so we can expect medium high to high productivity. And those are only like high, um, high level numbers using um, the a average price of hemp fiber and an average price of the of the seeds. And uh, for your hemp system, you're gonna for the low productivity and medium low, this is the amount of um, this is the revenue that you can expect. Whereas for your combined system, this is this is the amount of uh, revenue you can you would you would sort of get. Those are only high level numbers, but this actually shows that there is actually um, it, there is like but there is the potential of using a combined system. It demonstrates that it is more um, it is more profitable if you use both your hand meters and your hand. So what we will do now is like we will try to so those are like scenario analysis using just like literature value. What we want to do now is like we want to do some experimental work where we will get um, soil, soil samples from um, some of our example sites. And then we will do a selection of high power accumulator and um, either uh, cross fiber or bamboo and then uh, grow them in those contaminated soil. And then we'll use ICP treatment to, deter to determine the metal concentration of the soils. We'll grow the plants, we'll monitor the plant growth, and then afterwards we'll analyze the concentration of the metals in the soil and the plants after the harvest. This can actually give us like uh, proper numbers then, where we will be able to see okay, if we use the high power accumulator first, then obviously we'll try and get new metals out and then using the less contaminated soil we'll try to grow our fibers on. And ultimately what we aim to achieve is like this overall biorefinery concept. This is actually integrating the work of both um, CIVA and University Metal team. So where you'll have your cultivation and then you'll harvest your plants. You'll have your plant processing where you get your fibers and then from your fiber processing you'll get your meat products. And then using this metal processing blocks, you can get your uh, high value metals. And then wherever you have like byproducts like residual biomass and wastewater, you can direct them to a biofinery unit where you can biologically convert them to more byproducts energy. And also, um, and also um, clean your wastewater and have fit for purpose water, which can actually go back and be recycled in your previous blocks. So this is this one now. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we, our next speaker is going to be uh, Dr. Wayne Truter. Uh, Wayne hails from uh, the University of Pretoria, and uh, he is a senior lecturer, and he also is the leader of the research program on forage, pasture, and land reclamation sciences. So Wayne will be talking to us a little bit about the cultivation of fiber-based plants. Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. Just a disclaimer of two weaknesses as a presenter. I talk too much. I can, I don't want to say I hardly stick to time, so I'm going to try my utmost best, and I don't stand still. So please excuse me when I dance in front here. Uh, it's just so that I get a better introduction to my own presentation as well. 
Um, ladies and gentlemen, I'm from the uh, Department of Plant and Soil Sciences, University of Pretoria. Um, I've been involved in land reclamation for the last 20 years. I'm an agriculturalist by training and uh, working in coal mine rehabilitation for many years, obviously trying to re uh, reintroduce agricultural systems on these mines. Nevertheless, I've been asked to quickly talk about some of the fundamentals of growing plants. We've just heard now how wonderful plants can be, how they can hyperaccumulate certain things. But that's only if the conditions which they grow in are sufficient. And I think that's what I'd like to talk about this morning. Right, so, yeah, this is what I was supposed to talk about. How to prepare soil for effective growth of plants, water management of plants, and then uh, challenges for growing plants on contaminated soil. I'd like to turn it around a little bit and talk about the challenges first, and then how to prepare that soil, and then what is required in terms of the water management of these plants. Now, the land capability classes of South Africa are very uh, unique. We have many classes. Department of Agriculture has now got a 14 or 15 class system that they want to introduce. But we pretty much got the eight class system. And I think what's really important is whenever you grow crops that you know what the land capability is of that particular area before you start introducing certain plants. Now there's different types of land degradation. There's obviously agriculture, not a pristine in, uh, activity like many people think. Um, has a large impact on soil, uh, especially topsoil. Mining, I think we pretty much here and understand the sort of consequences of these things and, uh, and really do create challenging environments to, to rehabilitate. Um, very often there's a disturbance of the different resources that support plant growth. And that's what the objective is of rehabilitation, is to try and reintroduce or try and construct those resources in a way that they will support plant growth. So obviously when you sit with situations like that, you have got to really recreate an environment for those plants to grow. Then there's obviously agriculture and conservation, a lot of overgrazing, a lot of natural degradation, a lot of topsoil loss. I can, can't carry on as much as I'd like to, but uh, there's a lot of disturbance in that topsoil. A lot of chemical loss, uh, not a lot of physical disruption as what you will find with mining, but again, provides its own challenges because a lot of these areas are in drier environments and make it sometimes really interesting. You get other areas where you have overgrazing and overutilization, and then you get a high rainfall, and then you start washing all the soil down to the sea. And it's scary to see how much soil do we export a year into the oceans from just bad felt management that you will find. And that's just typically what you will see uh, in those kind of environments. So let's talk a little bit about degraded and contaminated land. There's obviously various scenarios that you can find, and I've got a whole database of pictures that I've come across, and it's everything from just the spillage of acid mine drainage, uh, acid, dry, uh, acid mine drainage decant. You've got a lot of uh, salinity issues that occur during the rehabilitation processes. And then you get some physical disturbances in terms of compaction. And not every plant grows in that. And if those things are not in place, uh, those kind of soil conditions, you'll find that plants are really going to struggle. There's various different applications where you can use plants. But again, if the underlying substrate is not supportive of growth, and forget about it, because you're going to have a challenge from the onset. So very often we have to condition these things, and why do we condition them, and how do we condition them, and what's the purpose of that? We need to understand in these environments ecosystem function. Okay? What is ecosystem functioning? Well, when you look at that, it's everything that's in there, and it becomes quite a complex system to manage if you don't look at the most key, you know, the key important uh, aspects that, or factors that drive these systems. One further, when you go to rehabilitation, it's an agroecosystem. As much as we'd like to think that it's just a normal ecosystem, we have to use agricultural principles to intervene, to recreate that environment, just like farmers do to, crop, uh, to grow crops. We've got to change that environment. We can't always just use it the way it is, because that's not a normal environment for plants to grow in. So there's a lot of these agricultural principles that one has to apply to make sure that you condition those soils for plant growth. The ecosystem function, I think there's various processes involved in this to make sure that these plants optimally grow for whatever purpose, whether it is for fiber, whether it is for animal production. We've got to make sure that that interface between the plants and the soil and substrate in some conditions, because there are some mines that don't have soil, and they've got to use the uh, substrates that they have there. And one has to try and see whether one can recreate some of these systems going and just get it going so that you can support whatever life there is. Now this is a very interesting and a very important um, picture to me, or diagram if you want to call it, 
I think what's really important is that you, we, we're very limited to moisture in this country, okay? And there's a lot of work around how do we preserve the moisture we got from rainfall, we've got very high evaporation rates, so we have to preserve it. Now these are all the nutrients, and then you get ecosystem services, carbon sequestration, water quality, biodiversity, they all obviously are driven by a nutrient system. But that nutrient system is only valuable if there is a component that captures the moisture to make this more efficient within the system. So carbon at the end of the day is an extremely important component, whether it is in roots or whether it is an addition of carbon, uh, carbon material to uh, those uh, organic material to those systems. Now the ecosystem function, we have our environmental drivers, we have biogeochemical -ge processes that, do this, uh, that, that uh, support the ecosystem functioning. But then there is a species composition that obviously creates structure in that ecosystem. And this is how that whole system functions. We have abiotic drivers, which give you biodiversity, but our ecosystem function. But there's a whole way of trying to approach that and to try and make sure that you get this balance. You've always got disturbance, and there's a couple of different species that one can use to try and get primary production or secondary production on these degraded areas. Now, climate, and physiochemical factors obviously are also important drivers and different species have different functions consumer species, decomposer species and then other producer species that then make sure that you get carbon sequestration, carbon cycling and nutrient cycling and if these components are not looked at in a sort of a holistic way the system is not going to be sustainable and you run at really high risks. Climate as I've said, really important factor, mean annual precipitation not just the last year, the last 10 years, because that really tells you what the trend is and what the cycles are. Um, the driest years, we want to know what the driest years are, because very often if there's no moisture, nothing grows. Okay? And yet the plant can be as tolerant as it can to drought, or it can be a low water user. If there's still no moisture and it doesn't get to the root system, it's also not going to be that particular plant. Mean annual atmospheric temperatures are important. The generalized soil carbon contents of these soils are important because that gives you an understanding how water is then captured and retained within that soil system. The total depth of plant available water. There are water tables in these systems. In mining environments, the water tables are so disrupted, they're not there when you want them. And when, they, when you don't want them, they're there. Okay? So it's always a little bit of variation in these systems. Now these land capability classes, obviously we have better soils and we have poor soils. And they're going to support certain vegetation. They're not going to do it all. Uh, for, they're not one for all. And uh, one has to make sure that you understand these different conditions to get there. So there's chemical properties, physical properties, biological properties, and they drive the hydrology of the system. And the hydrology drives the nutrient availability. And the chemical also determines how the roots develop in the soil. If those roots don't develop, they will not be able to hyperaccumulate. All right? So it's really important that we ensure that there is this very good balance and equilibrium here that will support plant growth. And then you will be able to de biomass and get different species, basal cover, hyperaccumulation, all the different plant uses you would like to get from it. So soil handling at the end of the day, if it's in a mining rehabilitation context, is really important. Is how we use the soil. Very often this is a big, big failure on some mines. They do not look after their soils. And when they rehabilitate, they don't have soils. They put them in the wrong places in the landscape, and it just creates a whole challenge for a person. Soil preservation. You've got so many different types of soil types. You can't mix them, all right, because that's just going to confound the whole growth situation. So very important that these soils are preserved and put back in place so that they will support the type of uh, growth you want. So the soil dynamics is really important. What drives what happens in these different types of soils? Sand, clay, silt, they all got a different response. Two plants have a different response to them because of the way they use water and hold nutrients. Just looking from a soil physical property perspective, you can look at the different types of soils and the way they hold water. Now, if we're in a water scarce country, you want to make sure that your soil is going to retain the water. So if you don't know what your soil type is, you will not be able to predict how much moisture is going to remain present or retained in that profile to support the plant growth that is there. So large pore spaces, small pore spaces, obviously got to do with how much water remains in the soil. And if this is disturbed and all mixed and you don't, you just find that you're going to lose water, plants can't capture it quick enough, and you sit with some challenges with regards to 
water use, water use. Soil water holding capacity, I think that's really important at the end of the day. Is that what we're trying to make sure that we have in these different systems? Because without water, nothing's going to grow. Um, soil structure is very important to ensure. Else you're going to have this kind of erosion of the soil. So very often soil cover, root mass, soil carbon relationships are extremely important in stabilizing these soils for plant growth to occur. You look at the soil strength, and that is the, the strength of the soil to resist plant roots. Very often you find very compacted soils, and if you look at a system like this, where you've got soil strength, if it's so high, you've got a very low amount of biomass. So it doesn't get in there. So very often you have to ensure that those soils are not compacted so that roots can develop and to, to take up moisture and nutrients. So soil organic matter and soil organic carbon is extremely important. And one has to make sure that you have the different fractions. And it's not just about putting stuff in the soil and just hoping that something happens. It's quite a system that you need to obviously balance really well. And I'm not going to go into all these details, uh, but there are different functions of the organic uh, component. And that is these physical, chemical, biological functions, how they use, uh, how the uh, nutrients are stored, uh, it creates a resilience in the soil, uh, immobilizes pollutants from a chemical perspective, binds heavy metals. So if you've got heavy metals or you've got metals, let's not call them heavy metals, metals that you want, and you want to make sure that they, res they remain there for the plants to take up, you're going to make sure that there's organic material in these things. And then obviously it improves structural stability, and that just helps with water, inf uh, water management in these systems. So with cover, without cover, it just shows you how important it is to have plants in terms of not losing moisture through evaporation. So we have to provide some sort of vegetation cover, even if it isn't the crop that you are using to hyperaccumulate certain species. Because things like pH, which is also a very important chemical factor, and if the pHs are too shallow, uh, too shallow, sorry, too, too low, you will find that the metals will be lost. As soon as you improve the pH, you will find that those nutrients are easily absorbed uh, through the plant. Okay, another thing in terms of microbial activity, extremely important component. It really determines how the nutrients are available to the plants for uptake. And if you don't look at microbial activity in the soil, you are also running at a very low sustainable um, uh, rate. All right, so healthy soil microbiology is very important. There's various things in the root system that one can look at. I'm not going to go into this detail, but it's really important for plant growth as such. Now, the soil chemical properties, just to give you a little bit of indication here, if the pH is too low, then obviously plant nutrient uptake is not going to be great. Okay, so this is a really determining factor. And if you want to know what element you want to extract out of the soil for a particular purpose, you've got to know how and what are the regulating factors that will be able to make sure that your root system develops. It is typically a soil that is aluminium toxic, <coughs> uh, it's a specific plant obviously, that does not take aluminium really well, and you find that the root system is very small, so your surface of absorption is really small as well, so not going to be a functional thing. So pH is really one of the determinants that determine how the plants will grow in that particular area. It even determines the availability of the microbes, so it's a very important factor to consider during the time. So during the reclamation process, you've obviously got various aspects that one has to, and strategies that you have to apply to improve the soil, either chemically, physically, or microbiologically. And uh, we'll just look at a couple of these things. So soil preparation, obviously from a rehabilitation point of view, placing soils at the right, uh, right position in the landscape, and then obviously ensuring that you know which is the good, the bad, and the ugly soils, and how to treat them differently so to support plant growth. Landscaping plays a really important function in terms of the functionality of that soil cover that you have and where it is in the landscape. So I'm not going to go into that too much, but I think this is important is that we've got to condition these soils. We, in some cases, we have to ameliorate them. We, physically, we have to ameliorate them or chemically have to ameliorate them. And chemically sounds very bad when you speak about agriculture, so we just say nutrient improvement. Uh, which the farmers tend to like. They don't want chemicals in their system. But nevertheless, there are different options that one can look at by doing that. So if you've got a particular soil factor that is restrictive, there are certain treatments that one can look at to try and improve that particular environment. Revegetation, quickly going to run through that. I don't know what my time looks like, Jennifer. Um, so because I am going to run over time, I know myself. Five minutes. five minutes. That's going to be the fastest five minutes ever. Anyway. So vegetation is important, selecting the right species for the right purpose. 
knowing in which biome you are, because that is going to very much determine whether the plant is adapted to those climatic factors and topographical factors. So the vegetation biome has an agricultural function and it has an ecological function. The one supports environmental protection and the other one supports sustainable food security. Whether it's fiber or fuel or whatever, it still ties in to that particular function. So it provides organic matter, the vegetation, um, it makes sure that there's nutrients in the soil, food for microorganisms. Uh, you'll find that it, the roots can alleviate compaction. You'll find that if there's roots in the soil, better infiltration of water, less evaporation if you've got a nice cover. And obviously, there's many other management aspects that the vegetation plays an important role. Slope stabilization, surface stabilization, different species for different functions. You, may, you mentioned a little bit about cyanodactylon, very valuable plant in terms of st stabilizing very poor surface covers. Um, so that is a function, but at the same time, it has a hyperaccumulator effect. There's many factors that contribute whether the plant will remain there or not, and how does it establish or not. I'm not going to go into all those details. Those are agronomic principles, the quality of the seed, what the soil's oxygen content is, and, and, and if you want to really get technical, but there's a whole lot of these things. Now, for fibrous plants, we want to go for fibre, so we want to get the plant to the most mature stage, and then you've got really good fibres, but that will depend on the nutrients. So the fibre production is going to be very much dependent on how the soil will institute those different mechanisms. <coughs> Factors determining seeding success, I'm not going to go into that, that's if you're planting vegetation from seed, if you're going to go vegetative material, obviously there's other considerations there. Right, so when do you vegetate? I think that's the most important. Understanding when the plant's best time of establishment is so that you can manage it throughout the season of growth. And uh, there's a whole lot of information regarding that that I cannot give a whole lecture on right now. So, but nevertheless. Um, so there's other factors that one can do to enhance establishment of vegetation. Um, and that's just sort of the interventions that we have in terms of mulching, planting them with other crops to make sure that the ones that you want are going to germinate and grow really well. Revegetation with vegetative material, very tedious process, very expensive process, but at the end of the day it depends on what the end uses of the plant, which will then justify the economics of that kind of system. Water management, coming to the end. Soil water balance, very important, and there's many things that, that determine that, how that moisture moves in the system, how much is evapotranspirated, how much precipitation you get, is the irrigation, what is the runoff from that system, what is the drainage, and obviously that will determine what's available to the plant. Only if the root system is functional to be able to use it. Well, not only, but the, fu the functional root system will make the best of the water in that system. So crop water requirements, many crops have a crop factor. One can determine how much water that plant will particularly use in a certain in in an environment. Knowing certain parameters of the plant will then be able to determine what the water use efficiency is, how many liters of water is used to produce so many kilograms of biomass, so many kilograms of nickel extraction, whatever you want to do. Uh, but I, because water is a really important component of these systems. I'm going to skip that. Atmospheric evaporative demand is responsible for water, high, uh, water requirements. And so important that we monitor these things so that we don't have situations that if we do irrigate, we're going to have a whole loss of water if irrigation is an option. Whether it is with mine water, whether it is with clean water, makes no difference. You're going to have situations where the plants are going to use water differently because of soil conditions. So we've got new agroecosystems we've got to create in these mines, and obviously we're going to try and prove to a point that the system or the plants that we used is stable, and that will be very often de 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 determined by the soil or the sub substrate in which it grows. So rehabilitation target, obviously the end land use, that will be to determine the vegetative, uh, vegetative growth conditions, supported by the land capabilities class, and then vegetation selection, soil substrate uh, amelioration technologies or strategies are important, and then how that soil has been managed prior to that. So all these reclamation principles becoming important, starting off with conditioning the soil, choosing the right species for that soil or that environment, how to manage it, obviously monitoring it, and man mon uh, management con con is, is, constitutes a whole lot of different activities in that. I think lastly, just to show that these agroecosystems are diversified land management systems. And there's so many factors that play a role in the features, the function of these, and obviously the services which come from, from that. And I'm not going to go into detail on how these things obviously all interact. Thank you very much. Dr. Graham Thompson. Uh, Dr.
Graham Thompson has the privilege of being retired, but we raised his <laughs> retirement, so we're just now using all his many years of expertise. And uh, before he retired, he was the manager of, in of the Institute for Industrial Crops at the Agricultural Research Council. Um, and Graham Thompson will be talking to us about current growth initiatives in South Africa around climate crops. Uh, as mentioned, I've been retired now, so when Prof. Sue asked me, I said, well, yeah, it's going to take something to get it, all my brains working again, so forgive me if there's a few things. But actually, the two previous talks, I could sit down now and say to you nothing, because the first slide I'll show you is exactly what will happen. So I've included my ex-colleagues, Telefon of Estazen, she apologizes, she has some personal Drama happened last night that you couldn't be here. Quena, who is the HEP expert, and Johan de Brain, who is the Sisal expert, they're still at the Institute, still trying to slog away. Right, so I was asked to talk about current growth initiatives. So if you're all thirsty, you want to go for tea, we can stop right now. Because there are no current growth initiatives around the vast fiber crops. <clears throat> I'm not going to talk about bamboo, because the ARC has never touched on to bamboo. I know there are some initiatives or were initiatives down in the Eastern Cape. And if any of you have ever been out to the, the East and see how they use bamboo for scaffolding and that, you can see it's an amazing product. Uh, we've got family members that used to work for a company um, where bamboo is into kitchen products and all these sort of things and flooring. It's an amazing product. So, yeah, it is. But that's where we're standing at the moment. And I'm glad David from the IDC is here, and I know you're going to be cross with me later. So, yeah, and we've looked at this already, that, um, yeah, we just classify the, the plant fibers. You've got your wood, your hard and soft woods, and then the non-woods. The bast fibers, and the ARC is mainly focused on these. So we've done a lot of research on hemp, kenneth, and flax. Um, a little bit on sisal, which is your leaf fibers. Pineapple is also a possibility. And if you take it, we throw away a lot of leaves of pineapple plants. So there's a possibility there. I know the CSIR and that have been looking into that. Your, obviously your straw um, plants, your seed fruits. We, the ARC for years has been working on cotton. And then obviously your grasses. You've heard about bamboo and there's a few others that you could also use. Just quickly, if we look at a couple of the, the products, and it just depends on what paper you take. Some people will say it's equivalent to cotton. Some people will say it's better than cotton. And the um, thing that we're looking at, density-wise, the, the plant fibers are about the same as, as, well, cotton's also a plant, but it's a major one that we always base on. Elongation, maybe not as flexible, and, and, and that is as cotton. Strength-wise, some of them are a bit better than cotton, depending on which system you're using, but round about the same as cotton. So I'm going to stick to the four major uh, bast fibers. We did a study for the CSRR many years ago where they asked us to look into it. I think we looked into well over 50 different plant types for fibers. Came up with the conclusion that these four, sisal, flax, kenneth, and hemp, are the ones with the greatest um, potential for South Africa. So if we look at sisal, you've heard too that um, it, seems so it comes from South America, so it looks very similar to the tequila plant. Um, and it's vegetatively propagated. And there's a lifespan of 10 to 15 years. Um, you, as mentioned already, starts halving in about 24 months. Can produce up to 200, 250 leaves over lifespan. And you harvest about 150 k's off that but it only contains about 3 or 4% of the fiber, so you're actually harvesting very little fiber off it um, from that point. So. And also mentioned that it's quite a... Okay, sorry, these are the fibers. Um, they can vary in length, they're quite long fibers, and you get, with all these fiber crops, you'll get different classes of, of fibers, long fibers, medium fibers, and short fibers that could be used for the less. The different things you can see here for this one, the low grade fibers are mainly used into your papers and cloths and that. Medium grade goes into your ropes and that sort of thing and your higher ones can be converted into the yarns and used in the carpet industry. 
Right, production requirements, sisal, possibly your best one, it's pretty drought tolerant, can grow over a wide range of, of um, conditions, soil conditions, temperatures, etc. It likes a warmer climate, so mainly in the north. Rainfall up to about 600 mils or even less. Um, soil types pretty well adapted to the different types, so it doesn't like a very heavy soil or waterlogged. Um, things. Uh, it's got a quite a shallow root system, so you don't want to, um, doesn't go very deep. It's something that you might want to consider. And you normally plant it at about 4,000 plants per hectare. Harvesting. Harvesting is cut by hand normally, uh, quite labor intensive. And then this is the important part. When you start processing these plants, is where we come into the stumbling block. We have a lot with the wash fibers. <laughs> in South Africa, and I'll talk later on the other two, other th three crops where we've done more work. Right, so the first step after the harvesting is what we know as the scutching or the deep cortification of it, where we extract the fibers from the plant tissues. Now with sisal it's pretty easy, you just beat, beat it to, to death, and then you extract the fibers by washing it away, drying the fibers, and combing them out. It's a lot simpler than the other crops. Right, yield and current production, as I said, not much going on here, but your potential yield is about a ton per hectare per annum, but we've, past history has shown that it's a bit lower, lower. Now if you read into the history of South Africa, there was a lot of sisal being produced in South Africa. Around about the 1970s, it was about 44,000 hectares, mainly in the northern KZ end and the former Transvaal, which is now Limpopo and Pumalonga. But then it suddenly crashed. I've got to be careful because my brother-in-law is here and he used to be in synthetic fibers. And that's the reason it crashed. So, yeah. Okay, currently there are two that we hear of. The one is near Guiani. It's about 180 hectares. They're still trying to get that going. Kick-started and that. Um, but it's just not. There was another initiative in Madikwe in the northern province. The last when we had a chat to the people involved there, they said, no, the ladies don't like harvesting the plants because it's very difficult to do with a baby on your back. <laughs> so that project seems to die. Okay, the next crop that we've done quite a bit of work on is flax, um, which comes from India. And those of us that know our Bible, flax even gets talked of in, in the Bible, so it's a very old plant. And we have the two types. You have the seed type, linseed oil, the old ones amongst us that know we used to treat our cricket bats with linseed oil many years ago. And then you have the fiber types. The fiber types be more erect, unblanched, unbranched, and they grow to about 1.2 meters high, whereas the linseed are branched and a bit shorter. Um, you do get, um, as the others have talked about, the dual purpose crops, but then you are giving on both sides. So if you really want good quality fiber, you go for pure fiber um, varieties. If you want good quality seed, you'd rather go for, uh, for the seed. So, and that's the same. Flex fiber, um, they come in these bundles. Um, they're not too, too long. And that, and they form end to end. They're about 45% cellulose, 21% lignin. They're quite soft and supple, but as I mentioned previously, not as good as wool or cotton, but they are stronger um, than that. In the linseed, uh, the seeds can have about 30, 35%, 35 to 45% oil, 18 to 26% protein, so it's possibly your best source of the omega-3 fatty acids. So it's very valuable there for your nutrients. Uh, possibility of flax. Now flax is mainly for linen. Okay, so the main one, the long fibers are used for your linen. The shorter ones can be used into the other things, mixed with cotton into yarns, your geotextiles, insulation, <coughs> etc., into biocomposites, into going into the vehicles, and then the, the sort of really rubbish, the short ones are used for animal bedding and that. It's actually quite a big market in South Africa, the big demand for that. But it's, if it can, it's quite absorbent, it can absorb a lot of 12% water and that increases its strength. 
It dries rapidly, anti-static, and a very good substitute for things like fiberglass. As I mentioned, the linseed oil, very nutritive, also very valuable in your paint and wool industry um, as a preservative and obviously co cosmetics. Right, what does flax need? Flax is actually a winter crop, winter rainfall crop, so it competes with wh wheat. Wherever you can grow wheat during the winter, you can grow flax. So it's one of those, and it's a nice crop also to go into, as Wayne talked about, crop rotation, good one to go that, and you can use most of the machinery that you use for, for wheat to, to um, plant and, and process um, flax as well, especially the seed varieties. So a lot, oh, sorry, a lot of our work is focused mainly down in the, in the Western Cape, um, that area, uh, looking into that, so you can grow it up to about 700 meters above sea level. It can withstand freezing conditions, the seedlings, and it needs a fair amount of rain during that period. Soil types, much the same as wheat, they don't like too heavy as soils, but otherwise will do most. And the, the fiber varieties you planted are slightly denser than uh, the, the linseed varieties, which need more area for the branching. Harvesting, quite simple. Um, you'll harvest when it's about the linseed, when about 75% of the seed heads are turning brown, you'll go in and harvest them, uh, much like you would with wheat, etc. The flax varieties, when the stems start turning yellow. And this is important. One of the things that we've shown through the research that the ALC has done is what is the optimum stage for harvesting to get the best fibers. I'll talk a little bit later on the Kenneth where they went wrong uh, and did that. So that's, and then we come to the big stage that is challenging people in South Africa in particular. And that is, uh, sorry, not used to the remote, um, the retting stage. Now, retting is basically rotting. Basically, you've got to rot that stem to separate out the fiber from all the rest of the plant um, stuff in it. So this can be done, the normal way of doing it is you just leave it in the field and we do what we call dew retting. But that also a lot depends on temperature, the amount of moisture that's happening at those stages, etc. And it's something you can't control. So it's very difficult. Um, or you go into um, pond retting, as we call it, and you get that if you import these crops, especially from Asia, where the monsoons and that, and they've got plenty of water, you get beautiful fibers coming from that. So that's it. So we'll look. Or you can actually do it chemically. After that, you go into what I mentioned earlier, the scutching decortification process, where you actually separate the fibers from all those stuff, and you'll go into that, and then you can go into your spinning and whatever else you want to do from that. Right, what have we managed to achieve with these? We've done a lot of cultivar trials and that in the different areas from the Western Cape right through to Bathurst in the Eastern Cape, and you can potentially, for fibers, get six to seven tons per hectare if your conditions are nice and that's about 20 to 25 percent of the fiber content giving you about one to two hectares one to two tons per hectare for that the linseed you can get about two tons per hectare if you wanted to right current production there used to be about 500 hectares being grown in the western cape mainly going into the linen factory, which was based in Atlantis, I visited it about three, four years ago, and it was really pumping, looking good. Soon after that, I got heard that the IDC had closed down. David, is it still closed? Sure. Okay. <laughs> right. Okay, let's get on to my favorite, hemp. Uh, sorry for that. <laughs> capital there. Yeah. And I've actually moved across, so you'll, I'll talk about it later. Okay, hemp, as we all know, comes from... Central Asia, and they're the three main types of hemp or cannabis, if you want to really talk it. You've got the fiber one, which are the long, straight ones. Obviously, the definition of hemp is it's dacha without the kick, so there's low THC in that. The same with seed varieties, oil about 29 to 34%, also low THC, and then everything that everybody's talking about now, and here's the medicinal ones which are your high THC and or CBD. And that's your 
flower head of your um, cannabis plant, medicinal one, and that's what you want if you want to go for medicinal. There's all the lovely flowers, all those little bracts in that, and that's where your THC sits. You don't want those leaves. Okay. Right, it's um, an annual plant. Very, again, I'm going to stick now just to, to the fiber ones, not worry about the rest, and we're talking about fiber crops. Very upright growth habit, and it's, uh, it looks very similar to your khaki boss. So you've got to look carefully if you know khaki boss to, to look at it, if you're trying to see it. You can grow up to about 9 meters, but we normally, the varieties are 3 to 4 meters. And the big thing with cannabis, you get male plants and you get female plants. So with the medicinal stuff, you, you rogue out all the males and you only keep the females. You don't want them to be pollinated. Okay, the hemp fibers, again, you're getting the two types in there. You're getting the primary bass fibers. They mainly occur in the lower parts of the stems. And it's about 70% of your total. And you get your secondary ones, which are slightly shorter. And then you also get, as with all the others, the pith or the woody plants that you can also use. The longer types there, some people will say stronger than cotton, go into your textiles, uh, your, your technical textiles, your sails, etc., paper, substitute fiberglass, a lot, lot of work going on at CSRR into that, into your biocomposites. Bio your medium ones will go into paper, you can get papers there, that's how, you know, if you're going to these, you don't have to grow all these big pine forests, etc. And then your short fibers, It'd be used into your woods, your packing, your fiber boards, etc. Right temperatures, it needs quite a normal warm climate, so it'll do well where all the mines are. But the biggest problem with hemp is its day length sensitivity. It needs this 14 to 16 hour day, otherwise it starts flowering. And if you're going for the fly fibers, you want it to be taller than me, you don't want it to be shorter than my grandson. So if you grow it up here yeah, the, on the high felt region, your plants will be very short. They'll start flowering a lot earlier. So we found that most, the best reasons are the coastal re regions of the Western Cape and the Eastern Cape, where you get the necessary day length. Uh, standard needs a fair amount of water, but hemp makes a very de heavy demand on soil. And I think this is where you might have to consider too when you're looking at it, listening to Wayne's talk, is it has a taproot. So it grows very deeply. It's very similar with cotton. Cotton, the biggest area now is the Northern Cape. Because all those farmers that were doing maize, wheat, rotation, their soils have got com compacted. So now they're bringing cotton back in with this deep root system to reduce that compaction. So this is something there that you might, where the tap root will go deeper to get those, to those minerals that you might want to be extracting versus your grasses that are very shallow in root systems. Um, the plant density again also depends on cultivar, etc. but you need about 60 to 80 kilograms per hectare. So that's something else you've got to look at. We need a seed industry in this country for these plants. Harvesting, this again is critical. If you're going in for the dual purpose crops, you're going to leave them until the flowers are ripe, etc your fibers start decreasing. Once the plant starts pushing all its energy into the flowers, your, hemp start your, your fibers start deteriorating. So this is why a dual purpose is not as good as either a single purpose crop for all of these vast fibers. So you want to rather go that. Normally it's just cut and left to do red. Um, in this process you can do it better, as I said, with the pond retting, etc., where you can do it more controlled, and again, it goes through this breaking down process of separating out the fire, fibers, etc. And I'll talk now when we come to the Kenneth on a factory that's available to do that just for you. Um, and it's waiting for somebody to buy. And then it can be used into that. So this is a big thing. Yeah. One of the challenges still remaining to us in South Africa is the retting step of all these uh, crops. Right. With... The work that we've done, and the, the ARC has actually developed two of its own varieties, just waiting for registration, but DAF won't allow us to because of that. Um, so that's where you, you look, that's how your 
Uh, hemp would be that that's the height of the hemp that you normally get. You can get five to seven tons per hectare in that. So the current production again is zero. House of M, uh, been a partner of the ARC for many years, has tried for a couple of years now working with smallholder farmers um, where they've got permits to grow about two hectares in all the different regions on an experimental basis in the Western Eastern Cape and KZN. And that's about the only stuff at the moment. Um, but I actually phoned Daph, my friend Francina, still there. Um, she heads up the industrial crop section and plant production at DAF. I said to her, what's happening with the legislation? She says, we're still sitting, you've got to apply to a permit, to health, and they're going to tell you to put up a two meter security fence around your plot. Nobody can afford that. Okay? Tondeco of House of Hemp managed to get a lot of money to do that for those farmers. Right, the last crop that the ALC has done a lot of work in collaboration with the CSRR and the IDC, trying to get Winterton going again, is Kenneth. Kenneth, you can do is an annual or biannual plant, uh, grows pretty rapidly, etc. You get different types of cultivars available, your short growers, your medium growers, and then your, your long growers or your late maturing. Late maturing ones give you the best fiber yields and quality, um, but it takes a bit longer. So a lot of the research that was done was in trying to optimize the, the growth um, of these crops in South Africa. Again, you'll see that you get both the boss fiber and the uh, core. Boss is about 40% of the, thing, uh, the plant and the fibers are quite short, so they're not too well in going into textiles, etc. But you can see it, we were aiming mainly at uh, the biocomposites, working with the CSRR and, and the people subsequent, looking at if you add in value to these crops, you can actually start affording to pay a farmer the same price as he might be getting for his maize or his soya bean, because that's what you're competing with. If you can't offer the farmer a competitive price, he's not going to grow it because some of these crops take a little bit more work. Um, he's going to rather grow the crops that he's used to and look at that. So these are the possibilities. The markets are out there, but it's just a case of getting the, the processing done. That's I'm sure we're going to talk about later in, in the other talks. Temperature-wise, it a, likes a bit of a warm climate but does very well. Uh, we did research in, in most of the provinces and found that you can grow it if you just plant it at the right time. Um, it needs the normal rainfall requirement of these summer crops. It's a short day plant, so it doesn't like to... to um, it's, well, short days induces flowering, so you would try and keep it in your, your main summer period to get your growth. Uh, it can be grown in quite a wide range of soils, but obviously there's all the optimum, and you need 20 to 30 kgs of plants, giving you a plant density depending on cultivar, your purpose. You like to grow quite dense so that your stems don't get too thick. If they get too thick, uh, it's a bit difficult to process and the fibers are not as good quality as we found. Right, the harvesting again is you start when it just starts to flower. Previous um, work or times in the in, in, uh, Winterton area, they left it. They said, no, they can get more stem growth, the plant continues growing, and they left it. And that's why if you go to Winterton now, a lot of that stuff is still standing there, never being processed, because the fibers were just too harsh and brittle. So you need to harvest, uh, harvest these things at the right time to get the best fiber that you can out of them. You can do it in various ways. You can cut the whole stalks and just leave them. That's an example where you'd leave them in windrows and just the, the dew and the, and the weather to do it. And that's where it becomes important too. If you harvest too late when it's getting too cold and rotting, if you're a microbiologist, plant pathologist like I am, you know that the fungi then won't be growing so fast. So it takes longer or it won't happen at all. You need a warm weather, weather, so you need to start harvesting here by late end of February, early March, 
is when you should be harvesting, especially in areas like Winterton, where the, where the winter can come quite quickly. Uh, you can chop it up, you can take it into factories and um, etc. Uh, possibly, yeah, we've done a lot of work looking at the retting. Um, obviously, you have the dew retting, just leaving it on the field there. You can take it out, you can do it in ponds, rivers or troughs. We tried the trough method, method where you dig a furrow, you line it with black plastic and you pour water in it and you can do all that. But um, Johan de Brain, who did all this work, big environmentalist, and he said we've got to remember that Winterton is a big conservation conservatory area, so you can't pollute the rivers. <laughs> so you had to watch that. Um, what we also looked at is what we call ribbon retting. That's just where you strip the bark from the stems while it's still green, and you can do it. So you, you're taking away a lot of the material, you use less water, etc., then you can ret it either once it's green or you can let it dry and ret it later. Um, you can add bacteria. There's a lot of products on the market that you can actually get and add to that. Um, you can do what they call staggered retting, where you stand the fibers up in a bit of water for a couple of days and then lie it down. Um, all of what they call the biological ret method, which is much the same. You can even do it by chemicals with um, uh, sodium hydroxide. You can do it. There's enzymes that you can buy and add, but again, temperature is a thing. And then because Kenneth is very similar to sugarcane, there's a method that has been developed for sugarcane that you can also use. So there's a lot of methods, and it will all depend on, on the best system that you want and, and the quality of your fibers. Because one of the things that we introduced to these fibers that we took from the other work of the industrial crops from tobacco and cotton, is you get paid according to the grade. Something very strange, like you don't, a lot of these farmers are just used to maize where it's one grade um, and soya being the same stuff. And if you're producing A grade, you're going to get a higher price. If you're producing third grade, you're going to get a lower price. And that's where we, we were looking at um, that sort of stuff in there. Right, the yields that you can get with Kenneth depending on the variety and, and doing everything optimally. Oh, sorry. You can get up to about 20 tons, even more. As I said, in <coughs> Winterton, they did a, quite a lot. They even at one stage produced up to 2,000 hectares. Um, there was a, it's a rather sad story around the factory that's there. That's the factory that belongs to IDC, uh, called Sustainable Fiber Solutions. If you pass through Winterton, it's on the Winterton Burgle Road. You can't miss it. Um, and it's sitting there, waiting for somebody to start using. Uh, they did a lot, but unfortunately the champion behind this whole factory and that got killed the night that IDC, said the IDC announced they're going to sponsor the, the, the erection of the factory. He got killed in a motor car accident and that's where things um, didn't go so well. And then they also, that's where they left this 2,000 hectares. They let grow and grow and grow, and they only harvested in June, so the wrecking wasn't properly done, etc., etc. So you'll actually see if you drive past the factory, there's still a lot of this material lying there waiting to be processed. Um, but the work that we've done now, we've shown what was all the optimal conditions, etc. So I think IDC is just waiting for somebody to, to buy it. And the farmers will grow it there under the optimal conditions. So this is all. And that factory, they've actually used it, can process hemp and flax. So um, it's a multi-purpose sort of machinery. Um, some people will say it's not the, the best machinery that you can get available today, but it's there. It can be used. Thank you. Thank you, Graham. We've been trying to figure out what happened at Winterton, so that was really informative. Well, I think um, David can tell you more. <laughs> okay, so please, both of you, I hope you contribute in the discussions later on. Yes. I just have a question. I got the... Paulus, yes. Can you speak loudly? Um, some of these plants are invaded plants, and I just wanted to know how to, how to deal with that specific component in terms of permitting, and uh, uh, I think it's... A lot of industries that can be built around invaded plants and the fiber is there, off, but we have that limbo and cara and the other issue around biodiversity and, and, and these plants. 
Anybody's got some answers around uh, invader plants? Uh, I know bamboo's an, an invader. Um, certainly, I am. Can you maybe comment yeah, on, on the think, best? Yeah, most of these like flax, skin of hemp um, are not viewed as invader. Um, that bamboo is a little bit different from that point of view, but there's plenty of bamboo being grown already in South Africa. So before you can import a, a any new plant type into South Africa, it has to go through that and they look at all that and invade uh, <clears throat> Yeah, like yeah, there's some of the other oil plants that they've stopped uh, because of the, the invading possibility of that. Um, so you wouldn't have a problem um, in those. We, we imported the seed and that and there's been no restrictions from that side as far as that. You would have to bamboo again yeah, there's plenty being grown around the country. So I don't think there, there'll be a problem there unless they go back and suddenly, like the jacarandas. I mean, we all grew up with jacarandas up here in the north. Um, although I'm now living in Durban, I'm a Victorian, so. Uh, and, uh, yeah, then suddenly they, they declared that an obnoxious weed. You know? so, but we're not chopping out our jacarandas. We love them too much. So, yeah, that, that is it. So I don't think it, from that point of view you could um, get a problem. If you bring in any of the new crops, it might have to go through DAP's whole phases to do that. Um, I have a question. I, I've noticed that most of the trials seem to be done in the Western Cape, which is a winter rainfall area. And I, know I used to garden. I was a passionate gardener in the Transvaal and now, and I couldn't believe how terrible the gardens were in the Western Cape, mostly, unless you live right under the mountain. And uh, now I know why. I mean, it's the winter. The only thing that grows in winter when the rain falls are weeds, and you get no rain in summer. It's terrible gardening. So you know that surprised me that the trial is a lot of done in winter, and then also it makes more sense, obviously, in the in because it's more tropical. What do you think the big limitation would be in the more mining intensive regions such as Limpopo, well, Mpumalanga, um, out in Rustenburg area? Yeah, look, the, the, the major thing, the, the flax, um, you can grow it anywhere in the winter. Okay. You know, but mainly because of the winter rainfall, the, if you're growing it up here on the high felt, you're going to have to irrigate okay. through winter. That's flax? Yeah, flax. Yeah. If you go through, if you drive, because I was based in Rustenburg and the head office was in Pretoria, you know, driving to and fro. There was a lot of wheat around the Brits area and that, but it was all under irrigation through the winter. So at that point, the, the hemp, as I said, that's a day length requirement. We do believe the Aussies have broken the, the day length requirement, but being Aussies, they won't share. <laughs> Is that a cultivar that they've cultivar, developed? Yeah, that, that, yeah. That, uh, because the, most of your cultivars come from your northern hemisphere countries. Um, mostly sort of more Eastern Europe, um, and they don't have the problem with the day length. Okay. Yeah. Just watch the cricket at the moment. Okay. Yeah, um, With the World Cup cricket, they'll be playing cricket there until 8, 9 o'clock at night without switching the lights on. The same as Cape Town. Yeah. So you've got those, that's the, the long day there. So you'd have to, if you're going for the seed, it's, it's not such a problem because you wanted to, the branch varieties, if you're going for the medicinal, um, it's the same thing, um, you can do that. But um, your Kenneth, we show it can grow anywhere, uh, that'll be fine. Yeah, it'll be the water again that, that might be the, the thing, and I think a big thing is, yeah, listening to, to the other two talks is, is you're going to have to look at the individual mine sites, what are the soils, um, soil types, etc., etc., to, to, to decide exactly what crop. and then. What will come out, I think, in the this discussions later on, is the markets. Yeah, okay. Yeah. All right. And I, I'm, I'm sorry to see that Andy Redford's not here to talk about that today. Uh, we, uh, the, 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 if we start to look at the at markets, we will touch on it in the next one, in the engineering one, but that'll probably be more on the economic perspective workshop, that we'll really focus on that. Yes, Wayne? Jennifer, I want to just add, maybe just up in the um, Pumalanga and the Popo areas, maybe more in Pumalanga in some parts of Kuzilu Natal. I think the biggest restriction with some of these crops is also temperature. Because what you find is when you plant them in the first season, they grow really well until they hit the first winter. Okay. And if you do not manage that crop around 
those, um, those cold temperatures and frost and things like that, it actually sets the plant back for the next season. And then the sustainability of the crop then is affected by that. Okay, so, so the, the, then it's it's around harvesting around yeah, yeah. So and around rainfall around. and frost no, and climate. In that, most of the the other three uh, or all of the besides sisal are annual crops really. Mm -hmm. So you you got to basically fit it into that temperature day length window that you've got. That makes sense. Farnas, you had something else you wanted to add. Uh, yeah. Perhaps a, a question to Wayne. I like that graph where you showed the water and the carbon and as it paper down to your soil nutrition. When we can have a plant, but unless our soil carbon is, is boosted and radically boosted, um, we won't have productive, sustainable systems. And the cost of boosting carbon in soils is just up, we're up against it. And I just wanted your insights as to how can we accelerate carbonization of soils? Yeah. Uh, because you know systems are disturbed uh, in disturbed environments. Uh, if we have to rely on those systems to carbonize themselves, uh, you know it might take too long, uh, and, and, and really physically the cost might just be high. So I just want to perhaps uh, your view on that. So I think what's really important is that uh, firstly I agree with you to import carbon organic material into the system. To build organic carbon is an expensive process. If you identify the right species that can grow in those semi-harsh conditions, you find that if, they, if they're adaptable to the climate and there's sufficient nutrients to, to sort of get the, the optimal growth out of them, these plants can put out a lot of organic matter into the soil through their root systems. But it has to be a climatically adapted plant. And, and the way you also manage that plant, to be able to stimulate root growth and so forth. You know, we get plants, we've got some pastures that produce up to 30 tons of dry matter per hectare. Now the rule of thumb is with those particular plants, is you've got two to three times the amount of organic matter under the surface. So you're putting down 60, 60 tons, 60, 90 tons of organic material through roots into that. So that is a, an easier way of getting the organic material built up in the soil. But it is a long process and there's many factors that will determine the decomposition rate of those roots and obviously the conversion into certain fractions of organic material. So that's probably the cheaper way to manage a crop on that, that area rather than import. Um, but yeah, there's, there's a lot of waste organic material around as well. If you can get it on site in a lot of these mine areas, like wattles for instance. But it's a cost factor, uh, always a cost factor. Um, the, uh, we, we're going to talk a little bit more about bamboo in the next session as well. Um, because they, they can make char from bamboo, which can also be used for, so you can actually, your waste uh, um, matter from processing can actually then be used to produce, uh, uh, possibly, it's just come to my mind when you're talking organic carbon to actually feed the crops. So, Paulus, are you saying that uh, with uh, uh, degraded mine lands, one of the biggest problems there is, is, is uh, they, they can't be well, we find that the oxidation rates of that carbon, because of our high UV, our high soil temperatures, and it's becoming much hot, much hotter, microbial activity are actually decreasing. And therefore, our conversion rates uh, or, or, or decomposition rates are not what it is in natural systems. Plus, if we remove our stuff from, from the top, we just consistently sucking out nutrients, and if you remove what you what you produce, you're not putting anything back the concept of that, that system will self-sustain by not reincorporating carbon into the soil, you know, that actually puts you back a bit. So we just need to be cognizant of the fact that the conditioning phase over 5, 10, 15 years, you actually have to might condition that area to such an extent that the carbon levels are getting back to sustainable levels before you just start the um, And obviously changes now between the climatic zones uh, where it's wet for more longer, it's nice, but as soon as you go into the drier areas, you know, your carbon stock, your soil of carbon stock. That's very interesting to see these links between the agriculturists and, 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 and the mine rehabilitation people, and, and this is what we're trying to get here. Yes, wait. So I want to just add and support what Farnas is saying here, is that there are ways of trying to, from an agricultural point of view, this is what farmers are doing. For many years they've conventionally tilled the soil, they've degraded the soil, organic matter contents have dropped, 
and now they're explaining the principles of conservation agriculture. And what that is, it's based on the sort of principles of biodiversity management. They're bringing in intercropping of different species, some that are sort of a shallow rooting system, some others with deeper rooting system, just as long as they don't compete in lower production, because production is what's important. So there are ways in different areas by combining species. The objective is, as Juan has said, because of our high soil temperatures and high evaporation rates, if you do not have a vegetation cover that preserves that top layer and obviously protects the roots, then you're not going to get a sustainable buildup of organic material. So it's really important to have those different plants growing together. So they don't compete with each other, but they have two different functions. And by that, you will quickly build up, well, cap, quickly as a as relative, quickly build up organic material in those soils, even in the dry areas. Um, but it's a slower, as our partner said, it's much slower in the dry area, and it will be in a nice, humid uh, grassland in the Kwazulu Natal or in Pumalanga. Well, and I understand why they're going, uh, going there, because I say it's quite different to be looking at using uh, uh, leveraging off mine land and degraded mine land. So I think there's quite a few lessons to be learned there. So thank you very much. Welcome to the second session on uh, processing of crops to, 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 to products. So we're going a little bit away from the actual uh, cultivation and rehabilitation and looking downstream a little bit. So we're going to start off with um, feedback from the Minerals to Metals project team. And uh, that's going to be given by Tapiwa Chamganda. Good morning, everyone. Um, I will be giving, basically, presenting the work that the Minerals to Metals team is focusing on within the COP, COP project, which is to really identify and review what are the downstream options um, for the recovery of value and products from your fiber producing plants. And for this purpose, we've looked at um, three case study crops, which is hemp, canef, and bamboo. So just basically, this review um, focuses on the potential for creating a multiple um, value chain. Um, so this flow sheet basically gives us an outline. Shilpa showed it um, earlier, but this is what we're using as a guide for looking at the different aspects of being able to process your plants. So your initial, um, after cultivation, hopefully you get all the parameters right and get the right crop grades and, 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 and heights. And after that, you've got your processing, which is your initial step, which would have your harvesting, your pre-treatment, which would be, um, as Graham spoke about rating earlier on, and your product recovery. And then you've got um, where it really gets interesting, where you're looking at your end products now, what can you make actually from these fibers and crops, and you've got your lead products, your additional products, and your byproducts, which are the other parts of your plants. So just to start off with, um, I will look at your boss fiber plants and what are the products around that and what can be made from them, or essentially what markets you can look at. So this was explained earlier on, but just looking at a cross section of the plant and looking at where the different fractions of the fiber comes from. So your boss fiber is where you get your long and short fibers, and then you'd have your woody core, which is an inner part of the plant where you get your woody tissue, which actually accounts for 60 to 75 percent of the stem, and different bars plants actually have different ratios. That's something to consider when you're now picking your plant, and obviously the fiber you want to produce, different plants would have different ratios. So now, um, as is the case with most industrial crops, um, you could use the whole plant, let me actually Okay. So as with um, industrial crops, most industrial crops, you could actually use the whole plant for energy. But we're really interested in, in, in creating um, a multi-product sort of industry where you'd have different products. So from your stem, you get, as I said, your bass fiber, your woody tissue, and from that you get your long and your short. And you can really then um, begin to see that you can make different products which have different levels of complexity as well, and you get from your high end to your low end products. Let's say your conventional textiles be your low end, and you get your bio um, And then from your other parts of your crops, you can get uh, the other parts of the crop, essentially, you could get your seeds, your leaves, that would also, essentially, you can have other types of products with different complexities from them. 
So just, I'm going to touch on the different, so the sort of the main categories that you can have from the different crops. And traditionally, your hemp and canaf was used for conventional, con, sorry, conventional textiles. Um, and these fabrics are breathable, warm. But what's really interesting is that you can actually blend these fibers um, with existing, you know, your um, like cotton to make lightweight and softer fabrics. And I think what's really developing is that um, plant fiber reinforced composites are now somewhat becoming your frontier sort of product for your fibers. Um, and these are made by embedding the plant fibers in synthetic or biodegradable resins. And what's really interesting is that a lot of uses are coming up for them, especially the automotive and aerospace industry. Um, and one of the industries that's really growing um, with the use of plant fiber reinforced components is actually electrical vehicles. Most of BMWs, um, i3s and i8s, which is the electrical vehicles, they all have um, KNF actually in the um, door boards, which offsets the weight of the vehicle by about 10%. So that's quite a huge growth area for the crops. The next sort of industry um, um, or product um, grouping that you can look at is construction materials, which is actually both have hemp and can have, um, range. The products can range from insulating panels, non-woven felt, acoustic damping, and what's really interesting that. The um, looked at and a growing sort of application for hemp is actually hemcrete, which is made by mixing um, lime and, and shives, which is, and the shives actually come from the woody core, the woody end layer of the hemp plant. And the other big grouping is actually your paper products. So it can, um, the paper products can actually be made either from your short bus fiber or your woody tissue. And the paper is actually, like from Kenneth bus fiber, it's reported to be comparable to paper from softwoods and hardwoods. So it's actually presenting quite a competition for um, your sort of traditional paper woods. And paper from the core or the woody tissue is not as strong as paper made from the long fiber, but it's actually easier to manufacture and softer and quite absorbent. And it's actually really growing in terms of um, using it in hygienic products like your tissue and your paper wipe. And lastly, just to touch on one of um, the, the byproducts actually, which is really growing for um, both hemp and canes is the seeds. And the seeds can either be used as whole, which would be your lower end complexity product, or they can be crushed and you could make oil, which would be considered as a sort of higher value added product. And similarly, your hemp seeds would contain a different um, oil percent compared to your canal. Now, in terms of the processing um, of your bass fiber, um, Graham touched a bit on it, but just to show it in terms of a process flow sheet where everything would fit in with as well conversion to the end products. You um, after your harvesting, you have your rating, your decortication, and the conversion to the different products. And um, for your bass fibers, the this sort of process is quite similar. Um, but however, as um, I think Graham um, pointed out with the rating, different rating pre-treatments um, result in fiber of different length. So it's quite um, one of those, I think, pivotal processing steps um, with the plants in terms of the fiber length you get, the color, the quality, and it's also then um, to affect the products you can make um, from the fiber. And as I said, bus fiber processing is fairly standard via decortication, um, and there are slight variations though, depending on your, let's say if you wanted to make high end or low end products. For low end products, you try to maximize the length um, to make textiles, but uh, let's say for your high end biocomposites, the length is not so much of a worry, so your processing would slightly, slightly be different for that. But what this really points to um, is the potential to really integrate everything um, 
hopefully getting all the conservation right and the rating right, um, you could integrate to get this multi-growth explosion where you'd get different product coming out at different stages. Um, and actually the most common pretreatment for use for bus fiber crops is um, rating, but um, I think as was pointed out earlier on by Graham as well, was that um, it needs to be under a very controlled environment and um, water is quite a big input for the processing. Now I'll move on to touch on, on, on bamboo and just look at um, the different products as well and then after that I'll sort of draw comparison and we can see the different side of sort of product profiles that we can get from bass fibers and bamboo. So with bamboo, similarly, um, as with the case with bass fibers, you could use the whole plant for energy, or you could use um, the calm, which in this case, bamboo, the stem is referred to as the calm, or the branches and the leaves. But I think what's important to note, um, to note about bamboo, a lot of the products come from the calm. So then that's when you now begin, begin to see the kind of decision making you'd have to make around what kind of products you make from your plants. So with bamboo, because most of the, um, a lot of the products come from the calm, it's, it's, it's going to be a decision between either or versus, versus bus fiber where you've got the different layers where you could get different products. Um, that's, that's already a big difference and a decision making point you could now begin to draw out. And I think a further complexity with bamboo as well, um, what's great about it is that you can make lots of products, lots, lots of products, but um, there's also a further complexity that different parts of the stem itself can produce different grades of different products. Um, for instance, let's say your middle layer of your stem would produce, um, your middle lower layer would produce like your flooring, but your upper layer would produce sort of different kinds of bamboo products. And I'll just briefly go through the different types of products or different product groupings that um, exist for bamboo. So one of the biggest product groupings I think for bamboo would be um, its wood-based products because um, the calm can essentially make different types of wood products of different complexities um, and a lot of these wood products have applications in construction and the building industry and the calm itself, what's great about it, it can either be used as a whole, um, as, as, as poles for scaffolding or it can be split into strips and made into different woven or engineered bamboo wood products where you can get ply boards, you can get woven boards or particle boards. And similarly, the calm can be processed further to produce um, bamboo fiber. Though, um, what I can say is that bamboo fiber industry is not as advanced as um, the bass fiber and the processing for bamboo to bass fiber, I mean, sorry, from bamboo to fibers is actually more intensive than um, compared to bass fibers. But with bamboo, there's actually different ways you can make fiber. Um, you could make um, bamboo linen or bamboo rayon and the debate around this is that the extensive treatment that bamboo requires to actually make it into fiber, it's, it's not in its you know, natural form, so is it really natural bamboo fiber as compared to you know, vast fibers which need less processing. One of the big growth areas actually for, for bamboo is in its reinforced composites. Similarly to bass fibers as well, the composite industry is growing quite fast. But with bamboo, the difference is that because of the strength of the bamboo, um, the composites you make are comparative to mild steel and have a lower density, and which really makes them more applicable for structural applications such as fencing and, and making sort of different um, um, composites. And 
when it comes to energy, bamboo actually has a lot of qualities which make it suitable for producing biochar. Um, characteristics such as its low ash contact and um, alkali index compared to other bioenergy feedstocks make it um, quite an attractive option for producing energy. And the bamboo calm itself can be processed into pellet form or other forms of fuel. So having said this, what this really, um, the next stage that we then look at is how can we possibly integrate um, the different products to make a multi-value chain because essentially that's what we're trying to create, a multi-value chain from, from the plants. Um, so with bamboo, you could have the calm, um, make it into paper products, which is like your bulk products, or you can split the calm, have it um, and treat it further, produce fiber, or you can convert it into wood products. Or you could treat the poles as they are and use them like for, as I mentioned, for, the, for construction purposes like skull filling. So with, with bamboo, because a lot of the products um, come from the calm, you get the scenario where you have to make decisions between one product or the other. Um, but what's great about that is that um, with the high quality stems, you could actually make fiber and you could make um, plywoods, which would be your high-end products. Or with medium quality stems, you could actually make bamboo mats. So there's, there is flexibility within that, but I guess the decision point would be, okay, what, what type of value product do you want? Do you want your low-end bulk products or do you want your high-end byproducts? Then that would then inform how you then process the bamboo count. And I think as Shilpa mentioned um, earlier, um, the potential for mental recovery because some of the fiber plants, I mean, essentially we're looking at having these fiber plants um, um, grown on contaminated land. So now, if in the event that um, there is metal in these plants, how would this alter your processing? Or, or So that's one of the areas we're also looking at. How would that integrate with the products we're trying to make? Or how would that alter the processing? So essentially, I think one of the first things um, um, to point out is um, there is some flexibility, especially when it comes to the pretreatment, because the different pretreatment um, processes that you could use, like for instance, your chemical treatment that could integrate and you could leach the metals out. But I think um, just from looking at sort of the value products that you could get from fiber, um, it would probably make more sense to have your hyper accumulator first to recover the metals um, prior to growing your fibrous crops. But that being said, there is potential to actually integrate metal recovery into um, the flow sheeting to recover the metals. But in essence, the type of treatments then that we would apply to remove the metals would then limit the applicability of the fiber. So then it will limit the type of products you can make. So for instance, your lead products that would really um, degrade the fiber quality. So you could possibly then move into biocomposites and you wouldn't be able to make textiles out of it. So in summary, um, I think one of the these are the main points we've really drawn out from trying to identify and review sort of all the products around the case study plants. You could generate multiple products, however the, ch the, the range of products um, will differ from the different plant types, but, and the selection of the product recovery and treatment processes will highly affect what type of products you could make and what output of your low end and, and high end products. So therefore, Exploiting these crops will really be, be determined by what are the lead products you want, what are the additional products you want, what are the byproducts you want, and then the relationship between all these properties, your process methods, and your desired quality. So basically, it's, it's, it's leading to a decision matrix of okay, what are the products, what products do I want, and feeding that design, what processes, um, um, yeah. 
what processes would you need, and that will also then feed back into um, how you plant, how you harvest. Um, currently, there are actually um, not a lot of studies which have really looked at integrating everything um, to inform the decision making. And going forward, uh, we'll now be looking at the decision making and looking at screening sort of the techno-economic and environmental processes, um, performance, sorry, for the different products. And that's it for me. Thank you. Okay, so our next speaker, after this is one of our, our invited external experts, is Dr. Uh, Maya John, and she's a principal research scientist at Polymers and Composites uh, Competence Area at the Council of Scientific and Industrial Research, CSRR, uh, in Port Elizabeth. And Dr. John's current research focus is on the development of materials from renewable and sustainable resources and includes areas on natural fiber reinforced composites, uh, bio-based materials, and agro-waste beneficiation. And uh, uh, Maya will be talking to us about the uh, um, development of plant fiber-based products for industrial sectors. Thank you, Maya. My pleasure to be here. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, morning, all. Uh, the topic of my talk is developing plant fiber-based products for industrial sectors. Okay, uh, a brief TOC. I'll begin with an overview of the CSIR and talk about some of our plant fiber based R&D projects and then discuss some of the important results and conclusions. Okay, the CSIR, our mandate is uh, cutting edge research and technological innovations to improve the quality of life of South Africans. Currently, we are embarking on amplifying the I in CSIR and focusing on problems that deal with industrial solutions. Okay, the R&D focus um, at PNC is on bio-based materials and it covers several areas. Uh, the areas of research are biocomposites, so there we are talking about natural fiber reinforced uh, composites with polypropylene with synthetic fiber as well as with biopolymers. Bio-nanocomposites is another area, so there we are focusing on cellulose material reinforced composites. Now, natural fibers are both hydrophilic and, and flame retardant, so flame, uh, are flame flammable. So, in order to use them in advanced industrial applications, you have to use flame retardants. So, that's one area of our research, uh, developing bio based flame retardants. Uh, as I said, natural fibers are hydrophilic, so they are prone to water sorption. So, you have to develop bio based coatings uh, so as to reduce the water sorption uh, when you use natural fibers in composites. Okay, uh, why do we use natural fibers in, in composites? Uh, they possess high specific strength uh, as well as the cost is low. Uh, when you incorporate them in thermoplastics, there's a weight reduction um, of about 30%. Natural fibers are renewable, biodegradable, so that creates a positive environmental impact. Uh, when compared to synthetic counterparts uh, like the carbon and glass, they are non abrasive and non hazardous. Uh, natural fibers, they, they uh, they possess a lumen structure, so that gives good acoustic properties um, and also safer, safer crash behavior when incorporated in automotives, and they are widely available as well. Some of the challenges with natural fiber composites is the hydrophilic nature of natural fibers because they are composed of cellulose and lignin, and they contain hydroxyl groups. Uh, they are prone to absorb moisture. Uh, but we have chemical modifications that can reduce uh, water sorption uh, to a great extent. Another uh, problem is um, the degradation temperature of natural fibers um, is somewhere around 200 degrees Celsius. So you can't process it with high temperature plastics, but with uh, polypropylene and most of the other thermosets, it's fine. So this slide shows some of the applications of the natural fiber composites. Uh, it's mainly in the automotive, uh, aerospace, construction, uh, and even in, in, marine in marine sectors. Okay, uh, now, now when we did um, our R&D on uh, plant fiber reinforced composites, uh, there was uh, pilot plantations in, in South Africa, as Brad mentioned, uh, in Winterton, as well as in um, the Western Cape, on the production of flax and canal fibers. Uh, there's also production of indigenous fibers like white silk in certain areas. 
Uh, also, we've got wool fibers as well, uh, Kashmir and more hair, uh, which are usually used for insulation purposes. How do we incorporate natural fibers in, in plastics? In what form? Uh, so, you can use them as short fibers, um, as long fibers, and these are normally the known wovens. Uh, you can use it also in the form of a woven fabric. Now, the known wovens uh, are usually made by three, three techniques. You've got the needle punching technique where the bonding in the mat is created by mechanical interlocking. And then there's a hydro-entanglement process where you use water uh, and in high pressure to create the bonding. And then there's a chemical bonding technique uh, where you use a synthetic uh, fibrolite called propylene, uh, which then melts to create the bonding. Now, the known woven technology or the long fiber fibers, uh, the advantages of the long fibers is that uh, they have a high aspect ratio, a length to uh, diameter ratio and uh, that actually gives better strength and reinforcement when it cooperates and composites. Also, there's uh, greater flexibility as well. Uh, so this is a this is the non woven line at CSIR where we can process a variety of non movements from uh, natural as well as synthetic fibers. Okay, so I'm going to my first project where we developed natural fiber reinforced composites for secondary structures in the cabin areas in aircrafts. Uh, so this project was in collaboration with Airbus and uh, they were using glass fabric um, to reinforce uh, phenolic panels, sandwich panels, and the aim of the project was to replace the glass with uh, a woven flax fabric. Uh, the project had two phases. In phase one, we focused on a thermoset matrix, which was a phenolic resin. And in phase two, we replaced uh, the phenolic resin with the bio-based uh, polymer, the bio-resin. So the composites were made, uh, the composites were basically sandwich panels, and they were made by first making a free preg of uh, the flax uh, woven, uh, which was impregnated with phenolics. And then the phenolics were sandwiched with an omics core, which was a compression molded to form the panel. So on top, you see the on top you see the sandwich panel that's made from woven flax and phenolic resin and below is the panel that's made from uh, the woven flax and the bio resin. Uh, so what are the three criteria in aircraft <coughs> performance or in any uh, or in any transport sector performance? The main thing is the use of uh, lightweight materials which translates into fuel and energy savings and also the use of environmentally friendly materials. Now here our main challenge was to maintain a balance between the strength uh, and the flammability requirements uh, as required by FAA and the Airbus. Now natural fibers are highly flammable, so it was important to develop a time treatment uh, that could be imparted onto the flax fabric and that would meet uh, with the uh, toxicity, the flammability requirements uh, of uh, Federal Aviation Administration and that of Airbus. And also it was important to maintain the weight of the panel. Okay, why bio-based materials in aerospace or in any transport sector? It's mainly the energy and the environmental concerns. Um, light weighting uh, automatically translates into fuel and energy savings. We've got the escalating cost of petroleum uh, resources as well as uh, the depleting side of it as well. And we've also got legislations like the EU's Clean Sky Initiative, which is focusing on uh, uh, greening of aircraft as well as reducing pollution uh, in air transport. Then there's the other legislation, which is the reach regulations, which is uh, restricting uh, the use of some of the chemicals, and it's important to find a viable bio-based alternative. And the last uh, one is the realization of a carbohydrate economy. Because if you look right now, most of our materials, fuel, and energy is sourced from a petroleum-based economy, and it's important uh, to create a bio-based economy from which all these materials can be sourced. Okay, so what were the testing that we did here? It was flammability testing uh, and the mechanical testing. Mechanical testing was a four-point bending test. The flammability testing was done uh, in a four calorimeter, and uh, these are the parameters that one would measure from the four calorimeter. It just measures the heat release rates of the composites. Uh, so that's the it's a bit technical. That's the that's a four calorimeter. That's how the sample looks, and that's how. Uh, the sample is when it burns in, in the form of calorimeter. 
It is some of the military results. Um, according to FA and Airbus limit, the heat release rate should be equal to or uh, less than 65 or 35. So these are some of the panels that we were that were produced using the flax and phenol adhesive. And here we use different kinds of um, uh, combinations and permutations. We used varying concentrations of pink tubs. We used combinations of woven flax with more wovens. And um, uh, in one particular panel, we used two kinds of pink retardants, one on the flax fabric and one in the resin. And uh, uh, most of the panels met with the requirements. Uh, so this is another preliminary result, where all panels are meeting with the requirements of FA as well as Airbus. The Airbus limit is even more stringent, as the permeability, the heat release value should be uh, less than or equal to 35. So that's the smoke, uh, total smoke release values. The FA limit is 200. Uh, as you can see, all the panels uh, are meeting with the requirements. This is the surface of the panels. Um, uh, yeah, the top one is the panel. The bottom one is after uh, burning test in the cone calorimeter. So as you can see, the flame retardant panel is, is quite compact, uh, while the one without flame retardant uh, is all distorted. Again, surface of panels with, with the flame retardant as a coating. Uh, the coating actually protects the, the panel from burning and provides an insulating uh, layer to the panel. So this is the mechanical testing where we did the four-point uh, venting test. And uh, as you can see, um, the average requirement was 350 newtons and uh, panel seven, panel nine are meeting with the requirements. Field test measures the, uh, the the addition between the skin and the core, and here, as you can see, the panel 15 is meeting with the requirements. So some of the conclusions of this uh, study was that um, natural fiber composites can be used as materials in aerospace applications if you can solve the flame retardant uh, problem. Uh, the flame retardant treatment that we developed was successful in complying with both FA and Airbus requirements. Uh, we also managed to establish a fire testing facility at the CSIR. Uh, we've got the cone calorimeter as well as the OSU, which is the Ohio State University Heat Release Apparatus. Uh, and that particular equipment, I think it's the only one in, in, in Africa. And if you want to test materials to be used in aircraft, the materials have to be tested on the OSU calorimeter. Okay. As we all know, natural fibers are used in the European automotive sector. Um, abundantly, and uh, why? Uh, the reason, when you look at what types of fibers are used, amongst all fibers, it's flax. 50% of flax is being used. And why is there such a drive to use natural fibers in the European sector? So you've got lots of legislation supporting this move. Uh, there's the end of life vehicle directives, uh, which is stipulating the disposal of uh, end of life vehicles for reuse and recycling and recovery of vehicles. So the EU directive says 95% should be uh, reusable and recyclable. The Japan directives uh, also say 95%. Uh, then you've got fuel economy standards in the US, so where um, the manufacturer, the car manufacturers have to comply with corporate fuel economy standards. Uh, the average fuel economy uh, is supposed to be 22.5 kilometers per liter. So that's all pushing the car manufacturers to move towards lightweight materials, to move towards national fibers. EU, you've got carbon dioxide emission values. Uh, 2015, it was 130 grams per kilometer. By 2020, it's supposed to be 95 grams. So as you can see, um, it's important that you have these kind of legislations and biobase incentives to um, persuade uh, the industry to move to environmentally friendly materials. Now this slide shows the production of natural fiber composites um, for the for automotive, and it is predicted um, in 2012 it was 90,000, and with the introduction of biobase incentives, it is predicted to be 350,000 in 2020. Without biobase incentives, it's, it is predicted to be 120,000. So that shows uh, how important legislations and biobase in incentives are for, uh, for the market to move towards uh, greener materials.
Okay, so this is another project where we develop a natural fiber composites for use as interior trim structures. Interior trim structures are not look bearing structures, and they are usually uh, like structures like the bed liners, uh, trunk liners, parcel trays, and so on. Now, the automotive sector is uh, a very prominent sector, and it contributes to about three billion to its GDP. But if you look at the local content uh, in uh, the automotive sector, it's only about 35 to 40 percent. Uh, and currently there is an APDP program which is um, aiming to increase the local content in the automotives to 70%. And currently most of the automotives, if at all they are using natural fibers, they are using imported natural fibers. So in this particular project, what we did was we developed the old movements uh, from uh, flax and kenna, flax polypropylene non movements as well as kenna polypropylene non movements and we tested the properties of the known movements as well as that of the composites um, to see if it matched with uh, the technical requirements of, of the car manufacturers. Now in this graph you can see that this shows the strength of the flax polypropylene and flax kenap polypropylene and uh, the flax polypropylene, all the samples actually are far above uh, the required tensile strength and are all, uh, they are all missing with the, uh, complying with the requirements of the car manufacturers. Okay, the last project is on um, uh, beneficiation of post house agricultural waste residues, and that's an ongoing project at the moment where we are trying to develop value added bio waste products from uh, waste, um, basically waste, maize stocks and sugarcane for gas. The advantages of waste is that uh, it is a waste and we are adding value to it, uh, it is abundantly available. There's no competition with food crops.